Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's episode of Kibitzing with Kagan. I can't even tell you how delighted I am to be chatting today with my friend and mentor and Shiro, Becky Wagner. Becky, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. You're welcome, Cheryl. I'm always happy to have time with you. Thank you. So I have a million questions I want to ask you. So first Please off, do. you are a daughter of Maryland. I Tell am. Tell us about your, your uh, growing up here in Maryland, and then we'll go start your career. So I grew up in Cecil County, Maryland, went to Northeast High School. I have five brothers and sisters. My dad was from Cecil County and met my mother during World War II. She came from Kansas to work. She was in the Navy, as was my dad. And um, so they, they settled after the war in Cecil County. And I lived there until with all of my siblings until we all went away to school. And then we're off on our own. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's great. Well, we are very lucky that you came down to this area and got involved in politics, policy, and the nonprofit sector. So we're going to discuss the trajectory of your extraordinary career. Okay. And I'm going to start with when I first met you, which was when you worked for Senator, the late Senator Paul Sarbanes. Yes. Why don't you talk about what that was like and what you remember about him most fondly? Oh, you know, oftentimes we meet people that uh, just really put a stamp on us. We can't not think every now and again of something about them. He was always a gentleman, so smart, demanding, but in a very gracious way, had high expectations for everyone, which made it easy to try uh, to, try to be that better person. Uh, I originally met him when my mom and dad would campaign for him in, in Cecil County, you know, knock on the door and say who was running and talk about him. And then lo and behold, I started as a volunteer in the early 80s in his office mm -hmm. uh, in Silver Spring. And one afternoon, he just walked through the door and you know how busy the hill is and that sort of doesn't much happen. And he just sat down at my desk. He introduced himself to me again because he was the final decider when I went through all of my interviews. Right. He was the final decider. And we chatted a little bit and he just sighed. And I said, well, that sounds like a Friday afternoon kind of tired sigh. And uh, he said, the truth of it is we're trying to solve the Middle East. And I don't know if it's something we can do. He was always, it was always right there. He was yeah. being pleasant. He was being cordial but it, he was always present of mind about the world's issues and where his responsibility was in making things happen. What a wonderful man. He was a wonderful man. A lot of um, Americans first noticed him during Watergate hearings and uh, just yes. his whole, the whole uh, span of his career and how he served Maryland and our nation. Yes. And, you know, he always, he always had a wonderful story about, you know, how do you know if you're serving the right person if you've if you've made if you're making the right decisions he was walking through the capitol building one one afternoon and a man way up on a ladder changing lights turned down and yelled hey guys there's my senator that's oh. my guy and so the senator said he always knew when there was somebody changing a light bulb on a ladder mm -hmm. if they appreciated him he knew he was on the right path <laughs> that's fantastic i love that I love that. Mm -hmm. So then you went to work in healthcare. Why don't you yes. talk about that? Because that's a huge issue and pretty controversial. It, it is controversial. And it was actually a step for me because I knew that, you know, my, my son said to me one time, mom, if you don't want to be Senator, you're in a dead end job hmm. at being a senior staff person for a United States Senator. And I said, well, you know, you might be right, because what I really wanted to do was to lead an organization that was addressing issues related to poverty. I want that's what I wanted to do. And I realized that staying with the senator would I could do important things, but it couldn't get me to that role. I I had a my bachelor's degree was in management and I had nowhere that I could prove that I had managed people. And uh, so I went to work at the Consumer Health Care Association uh, in order to have the opportunity to manage people. So I created a five-year plan 
and I said, I'm going to do this for three years. And I even, when I went to work, I, my title was assistant to the president. I said to him, I'm coming here to learn how to do this job. And then I'm going to get another job. And he was a wonderful gentleman and he had that job for 35 years and he was more than happy to have me come in and do that job. And so um, it was wonderful. He was my recommendation when I was getting ready to leave to go to Interfaith Works. Yep. So when you made that shift, I have to say a lot of us just were shaking our head because you were walking in some pretty big footsteps of Reverend Laundring. Oh, and yeah. the organization was called Community Ministries of Montgomery County at that time. So That's why don't right. you talk about that challenge uh, in, in coming in following Laundring as well as uh, rebranding and taking on a huge countywide organization. It, it was um, the most exciting work I've ever done. And I recently just supported the uh, hire of uh, the Interfaith Works new CEO. Yay. And when we first interviewed him, I said to him, this is the best job you will ever have in your life. And I truly meant it. Nice. Um, Lon, Reverend Laundring, such an awesome man, a, a man who takes the air out of a room. So, you know, when you're a founding director, yeah. that's important to be able to take the air out of the room. Mm -hmm. But when you follow a founding director, <laughs> Not as important to take the air out of the room as it is to sort, straighten up, mm -hmm. give a structure to, mm -hmm. and move forward. And literally, I called people who, the minute I would call them, would say, oh, Lon, and they'd talk about Lon. And, I, and I'd say, I'm right there with you, but let me tell you why I'm calling. Yeah, I'm calling about Community Ministry of Montgomery County. And mm -hmm. they would say, well, sure. I'm not sure I know so much about. Right. And it was because they had fallen in love with Lon. Yes. And were willing to do the important work right. that he was moving forward. So I set about creating a structure. And with staff, we were, we were 18 staff and a budget of about a half a million dollars when I came on. Mm -hmm. When I left, we were 120 staff and an $8 million budget. And, uh, all of that was good and important. If in truth, you know, our job should be to go out of business. Yeah. You know, if only. So the, the, the challenge of creating programs that solve problems is that it's a systemic issue, right. policy issue, systems change. And you know that you're a legislator. Right. You're addressing issues at the level at which they will be changed completely. And so while we are patching and bandaging and holding together people from the low income community, you have to find out why this is this way. Mm -hmm. My favorite story about this was right after Lon left, he told me, oh, I meant to tell you this, but you know, the way we do our advocacy, and he was a classic shouting at the gate man, classic. Right. Um, he said to me, let me tell you what the real issue is. He said, they put a new HHS building mm -hmm. up on Picard Drive. Mm -hmm. Guess what? There's no bus stop no bus. there. Right. So how in the world, if you have to access resources right. and you have to present yourself, how do you do that? So mm -hmm. you advocate for a bus stop. Right. And that's how that the, the mission of service, education, and advocacy right. comes together there. And this was way before the internet. That's even people, oh. if people could research and find out where they were supposed to go. Right. You couldn't email somebody. You couldn't search no. online. So yeah, really hard. And you would have to sit on the phone endlessly. Forever. Yes. And yeah. you would have to have a phone. So before we pivot to your next step, tell me what you're proudest of at Interfaith Works Community oh Ministries my gosh. of Montgomery. That <laughs> that's that's a really hard one I know it is um you accomplished so, so much I think um I'm proudest that the organization is respected mm -hmm. that when that when you see that interfaith work sign on a door yeah you know that whoever is receiving services there is getting a high caliber high caliber professional thoughtful care you nice. know that and then I'm proudest of being a little bit innovative, a little bit creative. Mm -hmm. How are we gonna solve this problem when you're told you can't solve the problem? Right. Well, we're going to figure it out. As I, I've said before, since many of my staff were women, I would say, 
we're smart women, we can right. figure this out. Okay. And so we would, and we weren't afraid to make a mistake. We weren't afraid to be wrong because our intentions were right. Mm -hmm. At all times, our intentions were right. And so one of the one of the things that I see that the county needs more of, we just celebrated recently the rededication of Becky's We're gonna house. get to that, Don. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's get that, okay. We're totally getting so, to that. Okay. So one of the things that I heard uh, one of the Interfaith Works staffers say about you the other day was that not only did Becky want big ideas and creative think outside the box idea, but she's also really good at saying no and figuring out what won't work, what we can't afford, uh, what uh, what isn't in the mission statement uh, and the right. focus. And that's right. super important. Well, it's really important. And I found that out in my first couple of years uh, at then CMMC. Um, everybody called me and I'm usually about taking those calls. Yeah. Everybody called me with the next best idea. Sure. And I was didn't want to be rude, didn't want to discourage because there's there's nothing worse than a naysayer, you know. Right. Oh, they don't get it. They're not gonna nothing worse than that. Right. So I would listen. I would talk. I would be thoughtful. In the end, I always said. So I have to. I and this is what I learned from the senator: say what you can do, and say what you can't do. Nice. Perfect. And then say where there might be room for us to find something to solve that problem. Right. And so with everyone with the next best idea, that was always my approach. It was my approach externally, yeah. but it was also my approach internally. Right. So Becky, you then decided to try to change policy and huh. you ran for the county council. And I have to say, I, I have never done this before or since, but when you told me that you were going to run for the county council, <laughs> I literally, we were in person, in person at an event. Uh, and I remember it was an event for Tracy Polson. I remember and, that. And you told me, and I literally started jumping up and down. <laughs> I was so excited. So talk about why you decided to run and what you learned about being a candidate. Um, I was hesitant to run, you know that. I thought about it and thought about it. But a, a member of my board, I trusted, I chatted with him about this. And he said, but what you need to remember is whether you run or not, you have already decided to leave Interfaith Works mm -hmm. and to move forward to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that helped a little bit because mm -hmm. I felt like I was gonna be walking away from my child. Right. Um, I. I also felt like there were things that I care about that needed to be lifted higher, that needed to be rather from the council audience needed to come from the council dais. And so I felt I could add a voice. And frankly, I don't know if you remember 2010, but the vitriol was disappointing. Mm -hmm. And um, I've done a lot of things and had a lot of things said about me in my life. But I do believe that I can get disagreeable people to talk reasonably to each other yes. about what's important. Yeah. So I felt like I had something to contribute. And yes. that's when I finally decided that I would run. Any regrets? I, I, I had regrets immediately, but not for long. You know, you're, I'm, I'm a competitive person. I was an athlete in high school and, you know, you play to win. Right. But... Um, I was disappointed that I lost. Yeah. I look back at why I lost. There are a thousand technical. No, there aren't. There are three or four technical reasons why I lost. So like I always what? say to someone, look at the numbers. Right. Look at the numbers. There were 10 people running, five of them incumbents. Mm -hmm. Really? That, that's a leap right there. Someone who loved me should have said, Becky, there are 10 people running and five of them are on the incumbents. And your last name begins with W, which isn't helpful. <laughs> and the dreaded W. Yeah. I was getting an award one time and it was a wonderful, the, the Washingtonian of the Year thing. And Jim Vance was, was, uh, was the MC. And 
you know, you have to sit there for two hours, everybody who gets their award. And he stood, when it was my turn, he says, and now the dreaded W. <laughs> <laughs> so I always think of the dreaded W. But I also realized that every, there will always be times in your life when you have to know your true center. You have to know yourself. So for example, at that point, I was 60 years old. And I was asked to say, oh, you don't have to say that. You could kind of say mm -hmm. something else. And I had to say, I know that that no cost me 8,000 votes. I know mm -hmm. that. And that's mm -hmm. how I lost 8,000 votes. So um, I was unwilling at this point in my life to hedge about what I believe right. and what I know to be true. Right. I was, of all the things I was willing to do, I was not willing to do that. And so 60 is a good number. 60 is a good number. It is. It's a good number. <laughs> uh, so anything that you learned that you'd like to share with someone who might be thinking about running for office either next year or down the road? Uh, this won't, I'm a really upbeat, positive person. This will not sound upbeat and positive don't believe most of what people tell you wow when you're running don't believe it in terms of commitment in terms of what um people who say you're going to be on our team uh, we're going to bring you we're going to bring voters to you mm. don't believe it wow. just keep doing the work and live with whatever Live whatever the fallout is. Right. Uh, it, I was surprised because I always think the best of people. So that was, I think that was the most um, deep and wide thing I learned. Right. The rest is by the numbers, you yeah. know. Um, and I always say, you know, knock on that door. I, if I look at my precincts where I received the most votes, I had knocked in every one of those neighborhoods. Nice. Nice. So, so, um, you know, not even the mailers, which are all wonderful and important sure. uh, to a point, um, knocking on those doors and of course, running at large. Yeah. It was Huge. impossible to visit with 800,000 people then and right. now a million, almost a million and plus. Right. Right. So, so uh, starting out locally, knock on every door. Yeah. And, you know, if someone will give you $1, that's worth 10 votes. You right. know that. That's right. So um, those are the those are the two upbeat things I would take away from that. Well, I was so proud to support you and and watch you flourish. And you did you. so beautifully in the candidate debates. I thought you changed the tenor and the substance and just brought such such insight. And I I think you're extraordinary. So but you got <laughs> you dusted yourself off and got back up and right. talk about advocates for children and youth so i was i was uh, thinking well i'm 60 maybe i should retire yeah and um one day i was uh in november so this was right after the full after the primary after the election right. i was upstairs ironing tablecloths and napkins for thanksgiving i ironed 32 napkins okay. and my husband walked past the door and he looked at me and he said oh you really need to go back to work yeah. and, <laughs> exactly he was right I like to do that kind of ironing because I can think you right know, it doesn't it doesn't matter how it looks because people are going to use them anyway okay right. um and so I started to to take a peek to look out and see you know well what might I do so what I couldn't do would be to do something in Montgomery County that required the county council and executive at that point. Okay. Because I you can't poke someone in the eye and say, oh, by the way, right. Right. That's <laughs> well, fair. this organization really needs X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was so I gave myself permission to look statewide. Mm -hmm. And that's when I learned about advocates for children and youth, which is exclusively yep. policy and advocacy research work. Yep. It was located in Baltimore. So that seven year commute in Baltimore was one, but you know, you'd spend 90 days, half of those days you'd be driving to Annapolis. Right. Um, very committed people who were doing data research. It's a, uh, funded by the Annie e. Casey Foundation as well as Open Society and all of the larger, more progressive 
foundations, no state money, which was important, no local money, which mm -hmm. was important because of the reasons I, I said to you, I, right. I, um, while, while the communities are improved over time, you can't, uh, you can't tell an elected official how wrong they are and then ask to be supported for how right. telling them publicly how wrong they are. Fair. We don't like to, we don't like for it to have to be public, but there are times when it, it you know, uh, when you have to stand in the center uh, in Annapolis and fight for the earned income tax credit to be expanded, fight for um, paid sick leave. Mm -hmm. And so every now and then someone would say, what does paid sick leave have to do with children and oh, family? My. Oh, really? Talk to any school nurse who gets kids because mom or dad can't afford not to go to work. Right. So, so that's what we would take the, the essence of the research, tie it to Maryland and ba background it with national research, and then just slog yes. through those Annapolis halls, persuading, persuading, persuading. Yes. So um, there was a study that was just released uh, a few days ago that ranks Maryland 24th among states for child um, well-being. And I, yeah. the study isn't out there for very long, hasn't been, I'm right. sure you haven't seen that. Off the top of your head, is there or are there one or two things that you might suggest that would be magic wands that would help Maryland to move up and take care of our kids better? Well, one of the, one of the immediate things at the state level, the new school work, the new school funding, can make a difference the if it's implemented yeah. and if the oversight requires accountability. I believe yes. that. Yes. Because you, you can't just use take that money and use it to backfill. Mm -hmm. These kids need health centers at their schools. Yep. They need safe places to walk to and from school, which means they need safe streets. They need yep. after school programming. They need preschool programming. Mm -hmm. You know, your mom and dad's dropping kids from school to school two hours before before class begins and and praying they can get out of work by quarter to six so they don't have to pay overtime for child care. Uh, so making sure that that school school money is spent comprehensively yes. for the whole health of the child, that's gonna make a, a, an enormous difference. We know that every time wages are increased and healthcare is available, families get stronger and healthier. Yes. And every time wages are increased, you know, can you imagine if you could get braces without begging for them? Mm -hmm. if, if instead of sitting alone in a row house after school, if you could go take a computer class mm -hmm. or if you could go take a dance class, wow. anything that lifts up kids is going to make them more whole. Yeah. So, so that was um, an easy question. Yeah, good, 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 good. Well, there are harder ones. Um, so uh, I have to do a, a little bit of a, of a brief brag because Delegate Sandy Rosenberg and I passed our second mm -hmm. telehealth bill. And because Excellent. our superintendent of education wouldn't work with us and wouldn't allow kids in rural and low income areas mm -hmm. to have access to telehealth, while parents were able to, but they couldn't, uh, we had to pass a law, which yeah. is, which was signed by the governor, one of the very few he signed, mm -hmm. so that kids could get behavioral health, uh, primary right. care, and dental care at school-based health centers. So that was huge, and we were able to get that huge. passed this year. So it is huge. I was also thrilled to see, and I'm sure you had something to do with it, that now a young person doesn't have to have consent of their parents. Yes. Yes, in that order was a to hot. receive. That's a hot issue, but you know what? If you have a 14 year old yeah. who is in such trouble that they would be glad to talk to anyone, I yeah. mean, truly. So I don't want to go way down that rabbit hole, but I can <laughs> tell you that it was a huge debate on the Senate floor. And there were colleagues of mine, bless their hearts, they're good yep. human beings, who yep. said, well, kids of that age can just talk to their mom and dad because obviously every student is in a happy family with two <laughs> two parents and happy good healthy communication right. and, and safe and all that it was insane <laughs> and anyway we got that passed <laughs> yes well i think that was really really important yeah yeah so uh so let's move on to the okay. the dedication of becky's house <laughs> um, so I was so thrilled to be invited to speak and for the opportunity to brag about 
you. And <laughs> as for folks who didn't get to get to uh, attend and celebrate Becky there, I can tell you that I sent an email to about a hundred nonprofit leaders. <laughs> and I asked them each to send one word that they thought described Becky. And, you know, you don't want to take a 45 minute, um, conference, you know, for, you can't, wedge in uh, 45 minutes of, of feelings about Becky in three minutes, but, you know, it was smart and humble and needed and, and thoughtful and, and uh, compassionate. And there were just a million different uh, um, <laughs> words. So talk about what that's like as part of your wonderful legacy, the renovation and big reveal of Becky's house. Well, it was, it was uh, early on that we began to notice, you know, aging in place is wonderful if you've got a place, if you've got a place that's safe and you can be supported. And at that time, uh, Priscilla Fox Morrow, uh, Reverend uh, Rosetta Robinson and I, all close in age, though I think I may have a few years on them, but um, all of us had aging mothers and we were busy, you know, we had resources, we had information, we had all of that together. You it was English? still- you're educated, are. you have connections, exactly. all of exactly. that. Exactly, yeah. all of that. Yeah. And here we had our shelters. We had the women's shelter. Uh, it was then called Sophia House. Uh, we had the women's shelter for the county. It was literally backing up with women who were getting too old to make it on the streets. Mm. It kind of reminded me when my mom was in rehab and the insurance company said, well, she's done with rehab. And we said, what do you mean she's done with rehab? And they said, well, she, she's failure to thrive in the environment. And I said, are you kidding me? And they said, no, any more rehab that she has will have to be private pay mm. because she's used up and we see no effort to improve. No effort to improve were, they, were their words. So imagine the women who are backing up in the shelter, these women have had trauma, traumatic lives. They have had no stability. Yeah. The best caseworkers in the world have not been able to pull them forward as much as they try. Yeah. So there they are, they're alone. And we just decided, and I thought at some point it has to be enough, enough. I get to be in, I get to have a bed. I get to be in a safe place. You don't have to push me out the door at six o'clock and tell me to wait at the library till it right. opens at nine. Right. Enough. Right. And I, I know um, you know this, that women uh, who are 45 street years, they may as well be 70. I was just going to quote that. I had not heard that before uh, yeah. the dedication. And that was really astonishing. It, it is astonishing. So what we decided was we, well, we thought, well, we'll just do a, our own assisted living program. We'll develop an assisted living program. And so Priscilla and her staff went for state training and we did all of this stuff and it just was not going to happen. We yeah. just could not get it to happen. And what we had successfully advocated for early on was that a group home may exist in a residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, let's just do a group home, six mm -hmm. to eight people. We right. will still apply all of the standards of care right. that assisted living requires. And so elderly, formerly homeless women now have a safe place. Many now, with in truth, disabilities. With disabilities, yeah. all of them. I mean, you right. went in and visited. I They're did. sitting at their table. They have a room. And I, I tell the story of the woman, Nancy, that Priscilla and I knew so well, you know, these women are not strangers. They're us. They're people yeah. we see on the street. They're our neighbor. They're someone. They're the clerk at the CVS. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nancy cut the ribbon on the first uh, the first iteration, and she yeah. went into her room and sat on her bed and wept. And I I remember saying, "Are you okay?" And she said, "I am so relieved." Yeah. And so you can imagine, and she passed two years ago. So she had a safe environment where she had friends, yeah. where she ate meals with friends, where she made her own lunch privately yeah. uh, for eight, over eight years before she passed. Great. So that was, you know, it's, I'd say it's the simplest of things. Yeah. And when big, fabulous organizations governments do big fabulous things mm -hmm. i know the return on investment gets praised i know all of that 
But I always said to the electeds, we have to be big enough to do this small thing. Yes. It has to be okay. It's not a small thing to it have a house, not. to renovate it, to make it ADA accessible, to find the right people, to collaborate, to have staff, to have the funding, to have to have the donated uh, house building, home building services, to collaborate with other nonprofits. To, I mean, that's, right. that's not a small thing. I, it is not a small right. thing. So I want to wrap up um, and get to our fast five. But before I do, uh, I feel like we've covered a really uh, the most of the breadth of your wonderful <laughs> career. Is there anything that we haven't talked about or anything you want to say before we pivot to the fast five? Oh, um, I would I would just say that as difficult as times are and they are improving, the, the you know, as frightening as things can be with a with the pandemic, with with uh, national politics scene, yeah. as frightening as that can be, it only takes us deciding one to one that I'm going to see the other in you. You're going to see the other in me. Mm -hmm. That we don't have to bring a loud voice to this discussion. Mm -hmm. That we can bring thoughtful voices to this discussion. And we have the responsibility to model that. Right. All right, so <laughs> Becky Wagner. Five quick questions to uh, let folks know a little bit more about you in, in other ways. Okay. So first, tell me three attributes that you think make a great leader. Uh, servant leadership. So being, being willing to lead by example. Never ask your staff to do anything you wouldn't do. Um, and probably respecting a new idea, listening. So I think that's probably four things that I threw in there. I think that's great. <laughs> okay, uh, question two. Do you have a favorite motto or quotation that inspires you? There are lots of fabulous and profound things, but I, I don't know if you remember that little cartoon, that swimming, that swimming fish and this Nemo says, yes, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And I think of that when it's hard, when it's hard emotionally, when it's hard physically, when you're going uphill, just I think in my head, just keep swimming. I like it. <laughs> For your very broad career, Oh, I don't even want to ask you. I was going to ask you proudest accomplishment, but I think that's oh, probably. Yeah. Do you have one? Don't, or should I ask I, you a different question? Yeah. No. I. The only answer I will say is that I do believe that I have made a difference for people that needed someone to make a difference for them. That's so perfect. Um, what is you have mentored so many of us. What is the biggest gift a mentor can give to their protege? Um, I would I would say that the the biggest gift would be to help them understand that I've I've had failures, I've had things that haven't worked. If you make a mistake, if it's not going to work, own up to it and move on. Just. Uh, learn to live with your mistakes. Don't beat yourself up about it. Because, you know, once, once you've said to someone, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Move on. Right. Amen. <laughs> That's what I would say. That's a good one. That's a good one. And the fifth question, Becky Wagner, the one that <laughs> I ask everyone, oh. what is your hidden secret superpower? What is something you're really good at that most folks can't do? I don't have to be right. I'm will. I'm willing to. Um, you can be right. I don't have to be right. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. And so I've learned um, how to manage difficult personalities, disappointing situations, hopeful opportunities, by keeping that keeping that in inside. You know, you may think I'm wrong. I may not think I'm wrong, but I don't have to say you're wrong. You know, I don't have to prove to you that you're wrong right. in order for me to be right. Right. Well, Becky, <laughs> anyone watching this will just 
now understand and agree mm -hmm. with the just the millions of ways that I respect and adore <laughs> you. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. And thank you much more importantly for your decades and decades of public service of being a role model, a leader, um, and a thoughtful advocate for important issues. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Of course. Stay well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>